Good day, everybody, and welcome in. This is episode four of Yes, Even Though the Screen Doesn't Reflect It, our ISU 152, The Beast Killer. Well, yep, we're looking at a plinth, of course. And the reason for that is because, well, like I said, this is a little scene that we're going to be making. It's basically a companion piece to the T-3485. And if you recall, in that episode or in that scene, I started working with this idea of putting a statue into the diorama base. Well, guess what? This is the time to use that. So let's take a trip to the Wayback Machine. If you recall, I ordered a white metal Frederick the Great. And there he is. I did a little bit of cleanup with the little metal file to get rid of some of those seam lines. Yeah, it's a little bit rough. It was for sure. And then a little bit of the burnishing fluid. Just put some of that in there. Give Frederick that little bath we talked about. Let it do its thing. And then after a few minutes, we pull Frederick out and he suitably looks like a bronze statue that he so well deserves to be. Okay, so what to do next? Well, we need to put him on a plinth. We need to get him the statuesque height that he deserves. And I have this little plastic, basically a medicine tube. And so I'm going to cut that down a little bit because it's just too tall for the scene. Just using my knife and a few strokes here. And oh, I should have better tools, don't you think? And just a little bit of a test fit there. Kind of, you can kind of see the scene starting to come together a little bit. Put Frederick hovering on top because that end is open. Let's fix that. I actually want to keep the bottom end that's intact because that will be a little bit of a decorative base to this piece. So I'll leave those alone. I'll just put a new top on it and just cut out a little bit of styrene plastic, glue it in place, sand it back just to make sure everything's nice and flush. I'll add a little bit of detailing around the rim. And then I had an issue about how to get him, Frederick, to stand on top. Just a little bit of epoxy sculpt, make a little bit of a scene there and push him into place. A brief moment for me to say thank you to my Patreons who have done a fantastic job of supporting this channel. If you like what you see here and would like a little bit more content, Patreon is your place. There's a link for that in the description below. Just this last week, for instance, I posted a little video on how to do some masking with Silly Putty. We have a Discord server for some chats, photographs of ongoing projects. It's a really good place to hang out. So I hope you join us over there. So bear with me for just half a second here because it's It'll all make sense. In my former life, in one of my former lives, I did a lot of fabrication for commercial subjects and museums and things like that. And in one of these projects, we made a, basically it was a 10 foot soccer ball that hung on the side of this building. And the client asked that it be finished in this marble finish. So it looks like this rock soccer ball that was being destroyed. And as I was trying to consider how to finish this plinth for Frederick here, I thought, why not? Let's see if I can scale down the techniques I use to paint the big giant soccer ball into something smaller for this diorama scene. So here we go. Well, the first thing I needed to attend to was that plastic tube because that type of a plastic just does not take paint. So it's got a little bit of Mr. Surfacer on it and I've sanded it back a few times. And now I'm applying what will be the base color, which is white gray. To create the marbling effects, I'm gonna once again set up my palette here. So it's once again, the white gray. It is medium gray, if I can look at that bottle, pale gray, and basalt gray. And so I get, get those prepared here, just in the palette. And now here's where the techniques start to come into play. This is basically one of those ultimate wet-on-wet -wet techniques. So we have our paint, and our, our paint colors in the palette. I'm putting basically equal parts of paint retarder with those colors. And then maybe two-thirds, so a little bit more water. So this is a very thinned out and slow drying paint that we'll be using to make these marbling effects. And so first step is just to apply the base color. So this is that gray white or white gray, just over the surface. This is our first base color of basically wet. And then, and this is where the techniques trying to scale it down is, is kind of difficult. This should be done with those kind of organic sea sponges, but I'm just kind of tapping back with a little bit of our, our common packing sponges that we use. Now notice the idea here. You can see the surface is still wet and also the, the, the lines that I'm making start from the top left and go to the bottom right. So there's direction in these, in these strokes here. So that's, once again, you're, you're mimicking what marble looks like and marble always has a distinctive grain and direction. 
once that first layer is applied and everything is still wet i'm using a little bit of a paper towel here again this should be something bigger like a lint-free rag but i'm just using paper towel hope hopefully i'm not getting a lot of lint onto the surface and now the second color this is the pale gray and i'm using just the side of a sponge and now i'm starting to define those veins just a little bit more by using the edge of the sponge notice of course that it is still wet on wet so all these colors will start to diffuse over time. Also notice that I'm following the same directions that I first laid down in that very first layer. And then, once again, we come back with another layer. So that dried a little bit. And now another layer of the base color. So now we're starting to add our layers. And these first layers are going to start diffusing and become very much integrated into the background, offering just that richness that we're going to look for. And then we'll keep building up from here. So we have that base color, it, we're wet on the surface again, so we're almost like starting again, but as you can see, we have a little bit of pattern. And we're adding a little bit more of that medium gray again, or in this case, the light gray, pale gray. Anyway, and just, just kind of reestablishing some of those veins, but now you can see it's starting to build out a little bit. We're getting some of that richness, richness, some of that depth that we so often see in marble. The process is repeated one more time. So I've got the little paper towel here and we're just kind of dabbing over the top of what we just did. It's removing some of the paint. It's diffusing some of the paint. We're just really creating that those layers of depth. Well, now it's time to get brave. And this is when we start adding those deepest, those darkest veins. Traditionally, this is done with a feather and turkey feathers are traditionally the way this is, is achieved, this type of effect. I'm going to use the side of this little sponge here and just ever so slightly kiss the surface. Just leaving little bits of paint in very random strokes. But once again, as you can see, I'm following the basic outline that we've achieved over those previous few steps. And because I'm an impatient sort of person, I just wanted to try something here. So I thought, well, let's see if I could use my brush to do this. And yes, you can use your brush. Notice where I'm holding the brush way back at the end and I have such a loose hold on it. Bas basically letting the brush just kind of dance over the surface. And that's real key because I'm trying to emulate or replicate what that turkey feather would have done over the surface as it just kind of taps and moves around and twists around to create those darker veins. And then of course, what we do is repeat the process by reapplying white gray, the base color over the top of this again. Removing all these different layers one more step into the background so everything is nice and diffused and we have a real depth and richness of the finish. Once I feel comfortable with the way the marble looks, the top of the plinth here where I I'm added the magic sculpt and, and the top where Frederick's going to stand, I wanted to make sure that that should look bronze. So I'm just kind of trying to replicate a bronze color there, just using acrylic paints. And then the final step is to give it a little bit of a luster of marble. So just a little bit of acrylic satin over everything. And with that, we're getting pretty close to done with this. And now I think we can turn our attention a little bit over to Frederick and get him ready to be plopped on top. He was a little bit dark in my mind, to my mind's eye, just not a lot of contrast with what we did with the burnishing fluid. So basically just a little bit of dry brushing just to kind of bring out some of those contours of his uniform. Same thing on the top of the plinth there, just to show a little bit of contrast, a little bit of shadowing, depth of shadow, maybe even a little bit of beginning with the weathering. And then just as a final step, just a little bit of buffing. And that just reestablishes a little bit of the, kind of the, the bronzy feel, that little metallic feel, just a little bit of oil from my fingers onto his surface, wipes back a little bit of that dry brushing so that I have a little bit more shadowing and and depth and then he should if I did this right he should stand there of course I'll put a little glue in there as well when we get ready to go just a quick second to remind you if you haven't done so already and you do like the content of this channel please hit that like and subscribe button it does help so much to get this channel out to more and more viewers now the part you've been waiting for finally made it past all that pa fancy painting stuff and now we can get to the IS 152 when we left off in the last episode, we are exactly right here. We'd finished up the stowage, we've did, we did the uh, painting on the exhaust, and we're waiting for tracks. Well, look at here, we have tracks. So let's talk about the tracks. Now the twist here is these are not the Fru model tracks. 
These are tank craft tracks. And this is because Brad from Tank Craft, he saw the video where my kit tracks basically fell apart and I threw them away. And he contacted me and said, I have a set of tracks. Would you accept them if I sent them to you? And I said, of course. Now, this is the first time I've used Tank Craft tracks. So let's go through this together. Thanks to the U.S. Postal Service, after a few days, the little box arrived. There it is right there. Nice little box art. Let's open up this little guy and let's see what's inside. Again, this is my first time looking at these types of tracks. I'm very excited to see what they have to offer. I've heard great things. Let's see if they live up to expectations. Nice packaging. A little bit of a sticker there for you. And we have, oh, the instructions on the inside of the box. That's handy. Including how many links per side, generally. And then packets of resin printed parts, all separated out by different sizes and shapes. And then I'm going to try to stay organized here. So we have the track pins, the left and the right, or the inside and the outside. I'm going to keep those separate in my little cups here. I'm also going to put some cups together because we do have the split links. And so I want to make sure that my A's and my B's are separated as well as I need those. Yeah, you would have thought maybe, oh, I don't know, I may, may have messed up my last set of tracks, and so I'm trying to be a little extra careful here. Yeah, I do learn from my mistakes, believe it or not. Now, here we go. We start putting these things together, and I have to say, these are slick as can be, easy slick. Um, you've, just make sure that you keep your left and right side, your inside, outside, you know, consistent through the run, and then the pins just kind of slide in, and if a little final push, they lock into place. Anything, any of those pins that don't lock, just a little bit of CA glue right at the outside edge will just make sure that they're held in permanently. Could not have been simpler, could not have been easier. I would say each run took me maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half, but look at this. Two, two full runs of tracks, totally flexible, and you have all these little extra pieces too, so if you needed extra tank tracks to put on your model, I wish I'd have used these instead of the ones that came in the kit. You have those. So let's get on to painting. Especially because these tracks are resin, I want to make sure that they've got a nice primer. Mr. Surfacer 1200 works great for that. And then for my base color, I like this lead gray. It's got a metallic, metallic -y type of a feel to it. But of course, just black tracks or dark gray tracks, well, that doesn't look very realistic. So I will want to bring up the richness of those tracks and I can only do that through layers. So the next layer that I'll be putting over the gray will be these basically earth colors. And I'm, once again, this is a basically a wet on wet type of a method. So a lot of thinner. And then I'll be starting with, this is the mud brown. Adding the darker mud brown color. Again, this is very diluted, very thinned out. And spraying that all over. And then this has, before this even dries, I'll turn to the next color, which is light mud. And then finally the lightest color, which is rock gray. Please notice how thinned out these paints are. That's basically almost like dirty water. And that's for a reason, because I want the paints to flow around the surface details. This step is simply about establishing a, the rich tones of the base colors. We'll add the weathering just a little bit later here. Once those colors dry, this is our result. And I think that's a pretty good base color to start working with for our final weathering. I guess the first step in weathering these is to try to get them to look looking something metallic, something metal. So on the high points, the parts that get polished off, usually, you know, we hit it with a little bit of dry brush of say silver paint. In this case, I want to try this true metal. This is a wax paste. And as you can see, it, I can dry brush it on and it's actually a little bit buffable. So you can buff it and change the sheen a little bit. It's a pretty neat little product. Um, something I want to explore a little bit more. We'll see how it works on this. It's the first time I've used them on tracks. Let's see what happens as we go along. And then next, I'm going to start getting into the areas where I'm most familiar, that of course being oil paints and pigments. This process could not be more simple, but it's very effective and actually very durable. Basically, what we're going to do here is we're going to take our oil colors. So in this case, it's shadow brown and light mud. And I have a selection of basically medium toned, light toned pigment colors. First step is take your oil color just stipple it in or smash it into the surface, so into the track links in this case. Over top of that, just take a selection. It doesn't really matter. There's no rhyme, no reason on how you do this. Just stipple in the pigments. Same idea as we did with the exhaust. The pigments will start to soak up some of the oil colors, and 
the oils will start to take on some of the the texture, the grittiness, the dirt aspects that we're looking for of the pigments. And the best part here is once the oil paints dry, everything is permanently adhered to the tracks. You can do this over and over again just to build it up if you'd like a heavier earth effect. It, like I said, it could not be easier. The last step after using those pigments and oils, I felt like I lost a little bit of that metallic edge that I was looking for. So I've got a little bit of just a light buff of dark steel pigment, just again, right over the high points, the contact points, just to reestablish some of that metallic effect. After a little while, everything dries and I end up with something that looks, well, like this. And that's not so bad. It might be a little light on the weathering, but I can always add a little bit more later on once I have those installed onto the tank. And so, yep, that's what I want to do. I want to install these now. <laughs> I'm ready, aren't you? It's been, it's been a few weeks here, so let's tie those together. Uh, pinch, pinch, pinch. This is always the awkward part, right? Got a little track pin in there and just drop that into place. I don't know how they do these on real tanks. That must be quite the, well, difficult. There we go. Pop that in and we're good to go. Just for ease of, of installing those, I took out some of those uh, return rollers there just to give me a little more slack. Put those back into place. Check the slack on this. Oh, look at this. They actually work. Isn't this great? Yeah, gotta love Tamaya and Tank Craft. Man, those are great. That'll make weathering that much easier. And then we end up with something that looks just like this, what we saw a little bit earlier. A spinning tank now with tracks. Well, guess you never know what you find here at the Propaganda Channel. So we start out with Michelangelo and some marble. And we end up with the Beast Hunter Stalin tanks. I hope you enjoyed this. If you haven't done so already, hit that like and subscribe button. Again, I do have a Patreon page. Link for that is below. Upcoming, I'm pretty sure that the next episodes will be all about starting to work on the scenic base. And once again, I do have figures in the, in the works as well. So we'll put a combination of all those together somehow. And we'll see you in the next episode. So take care, everybody. And happy modeling.